over the course of about six months through a massive elimination diet, as well as tweaking some things in my lifestyle, I started to reverse all of my autoimmune diseases and I noticed my vision started coming back. And eventually it, it completely went away. And the doctors, when they did their uh, scan of my eyes, my eye disease fully reversed and went away completely. And they'd never seen uh, a case where that had ever happened. And what's happened in the last 30, 40 years with the massive industrialization of the food industry is that we have created a far bigger chasm between the consumer and the production. And so most Americans have no idea how their food is made. And that's intentional. They don't want you to see how the food is made because if most Americans saw how most of this food was made, they wouldn't eat it. Okay, I'm uh, very happy we have with us Jason Carp, who has some really interesting stuff going on, and live from Texas, one of the one of the one of the best states in my view. <laughs> I'm biased; I spent most of my life there. But let me ask you, Jason, if you don't mind, just give us your, your background, your background a little bit. Yeah, sure. So I, I have quite a uh, unusual background, and I'll tell you how I got into health and wellness, and and hopefully what we're going to talk about today. I I was in finance uh, for about 21 years. In my first couple of years of working, uh, I got really sick. I developed three or four kind of unusual autoimmune diseases. And the worst thing that happened to me was I was going blind when I was 23 and was diagnosed with a degenerative eye disease for which there's no cure. And the doctors told me that it was hopeless, that I would be fully blind by the age of 30, and that I just had to accept my fate. And I always thought I was very healthy. I was a Division I college athlete. I was an athlete my whole youth. And I couldn't believe that I went from this pillar of health to literally dying a couple of years later and nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. And I decided to take matters into my own hands because I really didn't have any other options. And I was, frankly, a naive optimist. And I went down this path of studying ancestral diets and what they now call more paleo style eating and more carnivorous type of diets. And over the course of about six months through a massive elimination diet, as well as tweaking some things in my lifestyle, I started to reverse all of my autoimmune diseases and I noticed my vision started coming back. And eventually it, it completely went away. And the doctors, when they did their uh, scan of my eyes, my eye disease fully reversed and went away completely. And they'd never seen uh, a case where that had ever happened. In fact, it was so unusual for them that they thought they must have misdiagnosed me because they didn't think that this disease was reversible and certainly through food. And from that moment on, which is now 22 years ago, I decided that I would devote a significant portion of my life to waking people up and trying to clean up our toxic food system because I was literally a miracle in, in, in terms of Western medicine. And then this ultimately prompted me and my family, my wife and, and her brother Jordan, to create. It started as a ancestrally inspired restaurant called Hugh Kitchen in New York City. Hugh stands for human. Most people call it who, but it's actually Hugh. And our slogan is get back to human. Because part of what I believe is that why we're all so sick today is because we live at odds with how we've evolved as humans. And we need to get back to more ancestral ways of living and how we originally thrived. And Hugh started as a restaurant, became the number one premium chocolate company in the United States. Most people know us for our organic chocolate, which goes by the same name, Hugh. And I stayed in the investment business this whole time as we were growing Hugh, and it was originally a passion project for me and my family because we wanted to clean up the food system and show people that you could eat amazing, delicious, joyful foods without all the adulterants and fake crap in it. And then ultimately, as Hugh became bigger and bigger, I realized there was a much more interesting, larger play, which was to take what we had learned from Hugh and make a even bigger company, which is what uh, I do now called Human Co. And Human Co is my second chapter, which is the culmination of everything I've learned over the last 25 years, where we wanted to go after big food and create a mini 
conglomerate. And what we are is called a holding company. So you can think of us as a house of many brands and investments where everything under our roof has the same philosophy and ethos of how we built Hue in terms of simple ingredients directly from farms, directly from nature, no seed oils, no gluten. Everything we do is actually grain free. And we have three brands under Human Co. now, two of which we bought, one of which we built. Uh, the two, the three brands we have are Cosmic Bliss, which is an organic ice cream company. We have a plant-based line and a grass-fed dairy line with no refined sugar in it. Again, the cleanest label ice cream that you can find in the United States. We have a gluten and grain-free, seed oil-free bread and pizza company called Against the Grain. And we have a third company called Snow Days, which is a gl- organic gluten and grain-free, seed oil-free pizza bite that uses only grass-fed, grass-finished uh, dairy. And then under our investment arm, we're most well-known for True Food Kitchen. And True Food Kitchen is the largest full-service health and wellness-oriented restaurant group in the United States. We have about 45 True Food Kitchens in 17 states. Again, we're the only full-service restaurant in the United States that uses no seed oils, and everything is effectively farm to table. And this is, I retired from finance at the beginning of 2019. I decided to go full-time on helping people heal themselves and to clean up our toxic food system. And this is my life's work, and this is what I do now. Yeah, I'm I'm very much in the same camp, and I see the same stuff with these sort of quote-unquote incurable autoimmune diseases, and you you clean up their food and lo and behold, they get better. I got a question for you. You know, when you, this is interesting because you see a lot of companies where there, there'll be like a wholesome local product and they get successful and then it becomes a nationwide or even an international product. And it seems like inevitably all these, in, what you call adulterants, preservatives, things that keep the shelf life long because now they're transporting halfway across the world or halfway across the country. And it needs to be I guess, more durable so that it doesn't go bad. How do you get around? How do you grow a company to a large, or do you, or do you just have a bunch of local distributors and local manufacturers? How, how, how do you solve that problem? So when somebody gets so big, they don't have to deal with the shelf life issue, because I think that's one of the issues with so much of the food. It makes it cheaper to, to, to go bad on the shelves. It can be cheaper, right? Otherwise you're throwing away product. Yeah, no, there's a bunch of issues here, Sean. And Part of what gives me the vantage that I have is that I was a public market investor for 21 years, spent time in boardrooms, spent time with a lot of these public companies so I could see how these decisions get made. And uh, oftentimes, a lot of people who I speak to about this topic, they'll ask, how did we get here? Right? Because if you look 50 years ago, which isn't that long, we have been homo sapiens for at least 200,000 years. And all of our modern ailments, chronic disease, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and then even the things that are a little more, I'll call them, some people think they're not related, but they are, the rise in autism, the rise in ADHD. Uh, Probably the most startling fact for me is the 50% reduction in sperm count in males in the last 50 years. And a lot of people ask, like, how did we get here? Because it's just in the last 50 years which as a percentage of our evolution as homo sapiens, that's 99.99% we were one way. And then for that 0.1% of the time, we've turned completely sick and we're the sickest we've ever been as a species. And I, the reason I think how we got here that gets to your shelf stable question is you can, let's use McDonald's as an example, which is an interesting case study. McDonald's started called 70 years ago, and it started as a burger shack that was undoubtedly getting their beef from a local farm that was grass-fed, grass-finished, where the cow was allowed to pasture because they had no other way. There was no pesticides back then. Everything was effectively organic, and it was fried in beef tallow. And back then, it was probably not that bad for you. In fact, if you look at movies in the 70s, everyone was thin. Everyone was thin. And in the 70s, people ate burgers and fries, and they ate pizza, and they drank milkshakes. So it wasn't like we were eating just salads in the 70s. And so then you have to ask, what happened? And when you look at McDonald's, which is now a $200 billion company, everyone who wanted to throw a lot of capital behind all of these businesses that everyone wanted, 
They all thought, how do we make it more shelf stable? How do we make it more homogenous? How do we make the burger the same in this country versus France versus Italy versus Japan? And in the process of trying to turn food into widgets, we had to commodify animals and we had to commodify farm practices. And we basically had to turn all of these things into the same approach that we use for like semiconductors and things that we don't eat. And all of these scientific moves that all of these large food companies have done have increased margins. They've increased homogeneity, which is what they want. And they've done it and they've done it through chemicals, through hyper processing. And it's not just shelf life, Sean. They do it because they also can remove the variability of natural food, which, you know, all food, because it's natural, will have variability. And they didn't want the variability. And so that's where the whole like food science industry came from, was to use chemicals and synthetics to try to approximate nature so that they could get their costs down, get their homogeneity up, get their shelf life up. It turns out that when you're dealing with real food, of course, it doesn't last as long. And that's true. But it doesn't mean if you just use our chocolate company as an example, which, by the way, we did sell that company uh, a few years ago. But there's plenty of foods that are good for you and delicious that naturally have long shelf lives. Now, our shelf life at Hue was certainly shorter than the shelf life of a Hershey bar, but we easily can get six months. And so there's plenty of foods where you don't have to resort to this kind of stuff to, to make it saleable across the country. To your point, for some of the more, for some of the foods that, that naturally will rot or disintegrate or have a problem in a quick period of time, for those, you definitely need to resort to more local supply chains. You definitely need to resort to more local distribution, which by the way, is the way it used to work, right? Like when we were, not we, but when people were eating whatever product they were eating 50, 60 years ago, if you were getting beef, you were getting it from a local butcher and that local butcher was getting it from a local farm and you knew the butcher and you probably knew the farm. And what's happened in the last 30, 40 years with the massive industrialization of the food industry is that we have created a far bigger chasm between the consumer and the production. And so most Americans have no idea how their food is made. And that's intentional. They don't want you to see how the food is made because if most Americans saw how most of this food was made, they wouldn't eat it. Yeah, it's a fair statement, probably. Interestingly, and I'm sure you're acutely aware of this, there are a lot of products that make it on the U.S. shelves that are banned in Europe and other countries due to all these emulsifiers and thickeners and artificial flavors and colorants and stabilizers and whatnot. Why is that? Oh, so I'll definitely tell your listeners this, and you can Google this. This came out a week ago. I filed an activist shareholder legal led with a, a lawyer named Alex Spiro, who is Elon uh, Musk lawyer, a very prominent litigator against Kellogg. And this was in the news last week. We filed it last Thursday. And it was on this exact topic, Sean. And this has been the case. So basically the premise of my letter, which any of your listeners or viewers can Google Jason Carp Kellogg's letter And the whole letter is on the internet, so you can see the whole letter. It's only three pages. But the premise is of why I'm sick and tired of this is I'm I'm a parent of two children. I'm a concerned citizen. I was someone who was literally poisoned by the food supply. Kellogg sells, and most big food companies do as well, Kellogg sells a inferior, less safe version of the exact same cereals in this country than they do in most of the other foreign countries. And it's most alarming that it's also in Canada, which is just up north. And I was fed up because my son is extremely susceptible to the food dyes in terms of his behavior. There are dozens of ingredients that either require warning labels. Most of the food dyes that are used in this country, artificial food dyes, colors like red 40, yellow five, yellow six, blue one. You'll see these on ingredient labels of things like M&Ms and Skittles and gummy bears, et cetera. They're also in all the cereals. 
And my son is very susceptible to red 40. It's known and there's extensive scientific evidence. It's known to cause behavioral issues in children, learning impairment. And in the EU, artificial food dyes require a warning label that literally reads like a cigarette warning label that goes on the packages. And the big food companies do not want to have to put that warning label on their food that says, this product will impair your child's ability to learn and may affect their behavior. And so the big food companies developed a safer version of all of these products to be sold in these countries. And they're already making them and they already have the formulation. And it is the reason that they continue to do this is twofold. The first is that it is cheaper. It's cheaper to use artificial food dyes. And there's also a couple of preservatives that Kellogg uses that are actually banned. One of them is called titanium dioxide and the other is BHT, which are both known to be carcinogenic. And in so it's cheaper for them to use these. The food dyes, and there was a public situation with Trix, the cereal Trix, that you can also Google where the artificial food dyes are brighter and they have shown that children prefer brighter colors to less bright colors. And so between saving a little bit of money and having a brighter product, they still use them here. And the reason that it's allowed, which is, I think, a huge issue with the FDA and the corruption of our food industry, is the food lobby here in this country is super powerful. And we, because we have a purely capitalist system and the Americans effectively pay for their own health care, whereas in Europe and many of these other countries where these food dyes are either banned or require warning labels, they have a more socialist health care system where the government is the one who bears the cost of the health of their citizens. And so in those places where they're the ones paying for it, they don't want this shit in their food system because they don't want their populace sick. Whereas in this country, because the government's not bearing the cost and because the lobbyists spend an extraordinary amount of money with members of Congress, they continue to allow this shit in our food system. And the food companies take advantage of that loophole and they keep selling us this inferior product. And so what I demanded in my letter which I'm hoping and, and hopefully many of your listeners can get behind us on this, is all I'm demanding, and it sounds really simple, Sean, all I'm demanding is that big food companies sell the safest, most responsible version of the products they already make in this country. Americans deserve the best food that they already make in this country and should not have the shittier versions of that food simply because our uh, FDA and food policy system is corrupt. Yeah, I don't think anybody could possibly argue with that outside of someone trying to make money off the backs of sick people. But let me ask you, because there is a system when new products are brought to market, when new foods are brought to market, they have this generally recognized as, as safe like a label. And presumably when these products were first brought to market, whenever Red 40 or whatever you know, these things came on, they must have gone through some testing and if at a later date, it turns out that, hey, now we're finding out like this phase four clinical trial that a lot of the drugs go through. Ten years later, we recall everything because everybody's getting sick. Is there not some sort of mechanism by which to say, hey, look, we, it turned out we were wrong. Let's take it off the market. What's, what's the story with that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, a great, it's a great point you raised, Sean. So we have a completely different system for food approval here in the U.S., than happens in, in, in most developed countries. And in, in this country, it's called GRAS, G-R-A-S, what you said, generally recognized as safe, which for kind of your listeners, the simple way to think about it is in this country, when new food or products or ingredients are brought, it's innocent until proven guilty in this country. So they do a very minimal amount of testing. It's very short term in terms of how long they test. And if it checks a bunch of boxes, they allow it to continue. And this was the problem with trans fats. This was the problem with Olestra. There's a number of other kind of drugs and, and pharmaceuticals that later were pretty demonstrably proven to cause either birth defects, things like thalidomide. This is also why glyphosate 
was allowed here. Whereas in most of the other developed countries, they adhere to a different standard that is generally described as the precautionary principle. And that is with things that you're putting into human bodies, you're guilty until proven innocent. It's the opposite because they want to make sure there's enough time and data to know that this is safe for humans to consume. And this country, unfortunately, relies on extraordinary high burdens of proof with peer-reviewed, randomized control studies, which are very difficult to do with nutrition and human beings, which we could talk about that separately. And with the food dyes as an example, there's enough evidence in all these other countries that it should either be banned or require warning labels. But it's not as black and white as, say, cigarettes and the direct connection with lung cancer. And so if you read anything about the food dyes and the people who will claim, oh, people like Jason are conspiracy theorists and they're being sensational, the proof isn't completely there. That's true. The proof also isn't there that if you drink a, a little bit of gasoline every day, that it's going to kill you. But I don't need to see a peer-reviewed scientific study to not drink gasoline every day. And all of these artificial food dyes are derived from hyper-processing petroleum. And so I think the, the issue is that we have to adopt a more conservative stance like the other developed countries are saying, hey, we don't want to sicken our people. We don't want to have to figure out 10 years later that we made a mistake, which there have been, I mentioned a few, there have been dozens of these examples. And the way that they hide behind this is they hide behind the concept of innovation. And they say, we want to spur innovation. We want companies to develop products faster. And if we had the European approach, it would take too long. So that's why like Impossible Meat, as an example, Impossible Meat developed a molecule called soy leg hemoglobin that has never been consumed in human history. It's what allows that fake patty to bleed. We have no idea if you're consuming that for 15, 20 years, what that's going to do to you. But it did have enough minimal evidence that it got the grass approval. Yeah, I saw they, they tested it in some they tested it in rats and the rats actually had issues with their kidneys and some other things, but they, but despite that they still got that grass approval. What let me ask you, you've mentioned that there's a tremendous sort of influence that the, the food companies have on I guess our, our legislative body and whatnot. How much money are they lobbying every year? Is that is that number available? How much money is being spent to to influence policy? I'll give you a couple of alarming stats and a, a big, and I don't want to pick on sugar alone because sugar ironically is one of the safer of the things that we're talking about. And sugar has been around for hundreds of years. And obviously sugar is a huge problem with our modern metabolic diseases. When, and we're at a point now, Sean, I'm sure you know this, 25% of young adults and 50% of Americans have pre-diabetes or full-fledged type two. We are like literally the sickest we've ever been in human history. And eight of the 10 leading causes of death that sh that either torture Americans or shorten their lives are driven by food and chronic disease. In the case of the sugar industry, and I have some stats on the sugar industry, but 82% of the independently funded studies at universities have been funded by food companies. 82% and 93% of these, in, and this has to be disclosed, but most people don't see it. 93% of the industry sponsored studies show that there's no harm. And this, you have this across all the different ingredients where there's always someone behind it. And those people behind it obviously have uh, a, a very clear ulterior motive of pushing their products. I don't know the stats on all the other ingredients. But I can tell you that if you Google the thing about the artificial food dyes um, in this country and you look for the opponents of what I was preaching earlier, there's a couple groups that are basically like the confectioners and candy associations who are the ones that will be harmed the most by this artificial food dyes being removed from our food system. And they're, they have a, a big lobbying effort that is spending a, a ton of money to try to tell all of the members 
of Congress and the people who make decisions that there's just not enough scientific data to do this. And then they also try to couch it in. We want to keep American food affordable. So they gaslight us to, to make it feel like it's about affordability. And that's why we're allowed to have this, th- these toxic chemicals in our food supply. Yeah, I was doing actually looking into sugar last night, interestingly. And I think the biggest sugar company in the world is Cargill. I think they have $177 billion of revenue coming from sugar, I believe, something. I think it's like a half a trillion dollar industry or something along those lines. So obviously a, money, a lot of money is being made and, and uh, yeah, obviously marketed uh, through that. So let me ask you, so you filed this lawsuit or whatever. I'm not sure the technical terms for what you're doing. Has there, has there been a response from Kellogg's yet? Are they just going to, obviously they, they have unlimited amounts of money. They can probably, I don't know what legal things they can do. They, they, they put the more expensive lawyers on there and they do all the legal tricks, but it sounds like it's something that, you know, and I, I think there has been some con- congressional interest in some of this stuff. Yeah. I think, I think Callie Means was testifying. I think, I think that he did it. Front of yes. Ca- but, Callie is part yeah. of our effort, by the way. Callie is a friend and Callie is part of this effort of the letter that we filed. So what do you, what's the response been so far, if any? So the response online, so we released the, the letter and the kind of campaign on Instagram, Twitter, or X, and LinkedIn. There's certain things because it's a public company and, and I want to preserve my strategic bullets that I can't say on this podcast. But our, and then as it relates to your listeners, if you go and find me online, my handle is human carp, human K A R P, on all three of those platforms. You'll see that I posted also a petition link where all you have to do is put your name and your email on it. it takes 10 seconds. We have close to 75,000 people that have put their names on it, many of which are concerned parents like I am. And we want to get to at least 100,000, which is a magic number for getting some change. My ask in the letter was to meet with them, was to sit down in a private meeting with the CEO and the board of Kellogg. And I want to be very clear about something too, which is many of the people who work at these big food companies are not bad people and they're not malicious. They just have a job and they're just trying to feed their families and keep their job. And I have encountered a few malicious people in the last 15 years, particularly in places like Monsanto, but most of the big food companies are not malicious. The problem is that the whole system of public capitalism and public markets is rigged against them so that when they have a decision at the board level of we have this healthier product that's more responsible, our margins will be lower on it because we're doing things responsibly in terms of the animals and the earth and the not using chemicals, et cetera. And they have that decision of this product versus the ultra processed garbage, it's all chemicals. And the latter has better margins. Every single time they choose the latter because they ultimately have to report their quarterly earnings. And if the CEO of those companies start to miss their quarterly earnings projections, they get fired. And if the board goes the other way, they get fired too. And so the whole system is rigged to maximize profit at the expense of people's health. And so what I'm hoping to do You sit down with them, treat them with compassion and sit down with them and sit down with the executives and say, look, I'm not trying to, and I'll certainly acknowledge that I don't think hyper-processed sugar cereal even should exist, but just never mind that for a second because we have to meet people where they are and we have to recognize that this does exist as a product. And I'm going to say to them, all I'm looking to do is get rid of the things that are flagrantly bad right? We don't even have to have the discussion of sugar yet. Let's just simply, you're already making a superior, safer product in all these other countries. All I'm asking is for you to offer Americans the same safest version that you're already making. And I believe if they do that and they do it in a way that looks like they're being responsible and looking after the care of American citizens, I actually think they're going to get credit for it. I think they'll get applause. I think a lot of people will actually come back to them and say, hey, wait, you're actually doing something that might lower your margins slightly, 
but you're showing us that you care about us and it should buy them some improved loyalty and perception of integrity. And if they do that, and what's interesting, Sean, too, if you look at the stock price of Kellogg, KLG, since the day we filed the letter, and I won't take credit for this, uh, but the stock's gone up 20% since we filed the letter. And and, it, and it's very aberrant. If you look at the chart of the stock, it's like flat, 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 and then it just goes up. And I think the best case scenario is that the stock goes up on them announcing this because it'll give all the other big food companies that are public some cover to do things more responsibly and show the world that the public will actually reward them for behaving more responsibly. Yeah, I would certainly hope that's the way it plays out. I guess part of me thinks is this capital, obviously the capitalistic system is not going away anytime soon. And many people would say that's a good thing for sure. But what, why Kellogg? Just out of curiosity, why not Nestle or Nabisco or what drove you to Kellogg specifically? Was there any particular yeah. reason? It was just kind of random. Yeah, they, about a month ago, they got a lot of flack in the media for heavily pushing this new kind of slogan, cereal for dinner. Mm, um, yeah. If you Google Kellogg cereal for dinner, it's all over. They they made a television commercial with Tony the Tiger, Kellogg owns Frosted Flakes. They're best known for Frosted Flakes, Corn Flakes, and Fruit Loops. They had a commercial with Tony the Tiger, and I would urge all of your listeners to go watch this video because it looks like a Saturday Night Live sketch. You cannot believe this is real. And Tony the Tiger runs into the like someone's kitchen where there's two kids and two parents about to sit down to eat their dinner. And he starts telling the kids to chant cereal for dinner and to tell chicken to take the night off. And this was an actual television commercial. And then when the CEO was interviewed on some of the more kind of financial oriented channels like CNBC, he basically said that with food prices up, he's trying to provide a better option for families who can't afford the food inflation so he's trying to use food prices as this, this distraction to try to get you to eat cereal for dinner. And when I saw that, knowing how sick we all are from ultra processed food and what's happening to the state of this country, I just was so outraged that I just said enough is enough. And because Kellogg also, this is the other reason, Sean, Kellogg made in 2015 a public pledge that got much media acclaim and was in all the papers. They made a public pledge that by 2018, they would remove all of the artificial food dyes from their products. And it was on their website. And it was touted by many, many people as, oh, wow, it's a good thing. And three years later, they quietly removed the pledge. They didn't tell anybody. They didn't say anything. They took it off their website. You can't find that pledge on the website anymore. And they keep making these cereals, new ones. And they launched, the other person who's been involved with us in this, other than Callie, is a, a food activist named Vani Hari. She goes by Food Babe on social media. And she has been trying to get them to stick to their pledge as well. And pointed out when the, the pledge disappeared from the website. And she created a real stink because Kellogg launched a new cereal called Baby Shark when the Baby Shark song was so popular that was targeted at toddlers with all of this shit in it. And so the combination of the cereal for dinner and the public food pledge that they made and then quietly removed it, hoping all of us Americans wouldn't notice it, to me just felt like such low hanging fruit that I just, we chose Kellogg as, as the first shot across the bow. The regulatory agencies that, are, that oversee this, I assume FDA and USDA, have some input on what ingredients are approved and, and brought to market. The problem, my understanding is, there's a lot of the kind of revolver like we have with the drug companies, where you know board members are former members of the USDA and vice versa, or they go from the company to the regulatory agencies. Is that an inherent problem within the food industry as well? And, and how do yeah. we can we is it, can we hope to fix that? Yeah, no, it really is. Thankfully, Sean, there are a few 
members of Congress and the Senate, and there are some attorney generals that do care about this and have been speaking very actively about this. It, it's still a small minority. Senator Cory Booker has spoken about this uh, pretty vocally. Obviously, RFK, who's running for the independent, has spoken about this very vocally. There are a handful that are raising the flag and saying, hey, everybody, we are in the middle of a full-blown epidemic and nobody is talking about this. I think the revolving door of government in general has created this problem. And the people who want to continue to get elected either are unaware of this issue or the food price issue, because undoubtedly, if you go to cleaner, better, more responsible practice, undoubtedly, it will slightly raise the price of these foods. And that for many politicians is like a third rail that they don't want to touch. They don't want to go near that. And so part of what I've been trying to do with Human Co, my business, as well as some of our activism and philanthropy has been to just simply educate. Uh, you'd be surprised, Sean. I'm sure your listeners are, are quite aware of these issues because they choose to listen to you. And, and clearly you're a pioneer in this area, but you'd be shocked. And, and I would also urge you to look at some of the comments that we've gotten on our various social media posts around this. Most people don't know about this. They have no idea. They just think, oh, if it's approved by the FDA and it's in a grocery store, it must be safe. And they did, had no idea that there was a better version of Fruit Loops that sold in all the other countries. And that's why on my post, I show a side by side of the ingredient label of Fruit Loops in the US and the ingredient label of, of Fruit Loops in Canada, because most people have no idea that there's actually a different ingredient label. And, and so, yeah, to your point, I think there's a real issue with the revolving door of uh, members of our government where if they're not reelected, it just becomes, ah, that's an inconvenient thing I don't want to deal with right now. Yeah, it's interesting that you go to the store and you buy, you look at two sides, I'll use like cream as an example. One, one is straight up one ingredient cream and the other one is cream plus carrageenan, polysorbite 80, monodiglycerides. And the one with all the crap in it, it costs less. It's like we're, we have to pay more not to be poisoned, which seems to be it's crazy. It's kind of actually crazy. crazy. You know, it's, it's more ingredients, but it's cheaper and, and it's basically poisoning us or more, more potentially is. Well, you said your goal is 100,000 signatures on this petition. And wh wh where do you think that go? Where does that go with that? Do you think it just gets you an, an audience with the board of Kellogg or does well, it have some other? We plan to meet with the board of Kellogg for sure. I believe that's going to happen very shortly. So I don't necessarily think that's what we need to meet with them. I do think they want to work constructively with us and see if we can come to an answer that helps American citizens and children. I think having a sufficient number of signatures is evidence to members of the government and certainly Kellogg, but more importantly to me, this has to be done both bottom up and top down. And the bottom up is the demand side and getting consumers to say, we're not buying that shit if it has those ingredients in it and boycotting. The top down is getting enough people the same way it's, and by the way, it has been done with other ingredients. There have been ingredients that have been removed or banned in this country when they were proven to be not, or proven to be quite harmful. Olestra was completely removed. Trans fats are now removed. So there are examples where this has been done, but I think having a hundred thousand, hopefully it'd be a lot more than that. You can go to a lot of different people from members of Congress to attorney generals, to governors, to you name it, and say, this is not a fringe issue. This is a real issue that American citizens and their families care about. And you should care about this as, as uh, a politician. Yeah, certainly. And, and I, I'm just, like I said, I, I'm almost amazed that we haven't addressed this years ago because it just, it, you obviously, everyone's sick. It's not an exaggeration to say that. There's 70 something percent of us are overweight and up to a third of people have mental health issues. Uh, it's not getting better for sure. What is the, as far as when they test food in the U.S., my understanding is, is it acutely toxic and is there some genotoxicity? That's how I think they, they look to see if there's DNA damage. If it doesn't happen, then good, it's approved. Whereas we're talking about, what about things like mental health disorders? autoimmune diseases, which 
I think clearly have a role. The gut has a clear uh, contribution to that, and our gut is obviously impacted by the food. When you say we don't have the time, we, we've got to innovate, and we've got to get products to market right away, people are still eating in Europe. They're not starving. So why, why, what do they do different that we're not doing? I think it's a few, I think it's a few things. Europe is just fascinating to, to watch because and, – and, and this originally started coming out in the 80s with the well-known Mediterranean diet. And they also had something called the French paradox. They described it as a paradox because the French people and the Italians do a bunch of things that would surprise us based on what we were told in the 80s about the problems of fat. And for example, in those two countries, they eat bread every single day. They eat butter and dairy and cheese. Those are integral parts of those food cultures. The French paradox is basically based on the fact that they're eating bread, butter, cheese, and drinking red wine at many, many multiples of kind of quantity and frequency that we are. And yet, they live longer than we do. They're happier than we are. They have dramatically lower chronic disease incidence and burden. And so, this is one of those things where there's a fair amount of evidence, but there just hasn't been enough attention, I think, in the popular media. And I think it's a, I think it's a handful of things. So, I think first off, they take a lot more pride in real food in many of those countries. And by pride, they actually pay up. When you look at the percentage of their annual income, so the annual paycheck of all the people in these countries, and you look at that, how much of their annual paycheck do they spend on food versus this country? 40, 50 years ago, we as Americans were spending about the same percentage of our paycheck on food as they were. Today, it's half. Today, we spend half of the amount of our paycheck on food as they do. So they spend twice the amount on food as we do. And they do it because they actually have disdain for ultra-processed garbage fake food. They take pride in their farms. They take pride in their farmers. They take pride in agriculture. And the kind of and, and obviously, the history of these countries goes back thousands of years, whereas ours goes back only a couple hundred. And first of all, I think there's a cultural difference in mentality where they don't even they won't go near fake cheese. And France is banning cell cultured meat. And so there's a lot more pride. Secondly, outside of the pride, there's better regulations around these things. As I mentioned, it's hard to find many of these chemicals in those foods that are here. You can't even find them. And so I think the integrity of the foods in those countries is far superior in general with the chemicals. And then you also get into things like glyphosate and some of the very known toxic herbicides and pesticides that in many of those countries are also banned. And so the nature of the food in all aspects is far superior. And then outside of the direct nutritional component, there's other lifestyle factors that I think influence. They spend a lot more time with each other. They're less isolated. They're generally less sedentary. They walk more than we do. Interestingly enough, they don't hard exercise more than we do. We hard exercise way more than they do. And we're still way sicker. But the more simple, human life things like taking a stroll after a meal or hanging out with your friends. They're a lot less lonely. Their mental health incidences are way lower than ours are. So I think when we talk about ancestral living and how we evolved as people, I think it's a combination of the integrity of the food itself, how close it is to the farms, the lack of processing, the lack of seed oils, the lack of industrial ingredients combined with better lifestyle choices that allows them to eat these things that we think we can't eat, like pizza and pasta and bread and butter and lots of meat, and their health outcomes are far better than ours. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember the last time I, I can remember watching TV when I was in Europe, and they had a candy commercial came on, and, and, and really there was a warning label at the bottom, this, this will basically make you sick. Is I saw that on the TV, which I thought was interesting. Now, we've got our USDA, which recently they, they published a study, I don't know, six, I talked about when I was on Rogan. They came up with a 91% ultra-processed food diet, which they say could, could be healthy. And so it's like they're doubling, they're doubling down. down on this processed food, ultra-processed food in particular, and there's a difference. 
is that that is actually can be should be considered health food. I think that to that to me is disturbing. I mean, you've got people out there on the drug side saying that obesity and chronic disease, there's nothing going to do about it. Just just take medications. It seems like you're building the perfect business model for lifelong recurrent income. Yeah. Yeah. It's look, it, it, it's a, it's a rigged system in this country and there's a devil's bargain between the food and the healthcare industries in terms of how they cooperate with each other, which is the food industry is making sick in this country. And then the healthcare companies awesome. make pharmaceuticals to try to deal with your symptoms instead of addressing the root causes of the disease. It, 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 it's a true crisis. Over 80% of our healthcare costs, which are, are, are so beyond unviable in terms of continuing, in terms of how much we spend on healthcare, over 80% of our healthcare costs are tied to interventions that are related to preventable metabolic conditions. And instead of simply showing people a better, cleaner way to eat, we say, oh, we developed a Zempic. Take this. And then you can keep eating the ultra processed garbage. And my one other comment, Sean, on the processing, I don't think I don't think processing as a concept is inherently bad. Grinding up beef into patties is a form of processing. Making cheese is processing. There's many things we do that we've done as humans for hundreds and hundreds of years that are processing. Making alcohol um, and fermenting is a is a process. I think the problem with the ultra process and where it's important to distinguish uh, is that the more steps of a process, the more you're removing the organic matter, the things that make living things living, the more processing you go through it, the more you remove that. And what you're left with is literally dead food. It's not even food at that point. And I, I give this example. I show my son this. If you take ultra processed white refined flour and you put like a little pile of that flour right next to an ant hill, you'll notice the ants won't go near it. They won't even eat it. And it's a very simple litmus test. If it doesn't rot and insects won't eat it, you probably shouldn't eat it either. And that's wh where the ultra processing problem comes in is that we came up as a country with processing with a noble goal, which was to allow more Americans to be nourished. And what we realized when we were processing all these foods, and this happened with flour, and that's why you see the concept of enri enriched wheat flour, is that you remove all the nutrients. And so they have to add back vitamins and minerals to make it seem reasonable. But what we're missing is there's a lot of things that we still can't measure. We can't easily measure things like polyphenols, we can't easily measure a lot of the benefits, the synergistic benefits of food. For example, eating a full orange, you will get a more bioavailable form of vitamin C than taking a vitamin C pill. And we don't fully understand exactly how the synergies work of eating a whole food versus eating an ultra processed food and then adding a bunch of vitamins and minerals back to it. And so I think a lot of it is getting back to eating foods that are more whole, that are closer to their origin. And that's the first step. Um, assuming Kellogg's complies, maybe they don't, maybe they say they do, and then they hope it blows off and three years later they're doing the same thing. Do you have anybody else in your sites? Just, just maybe if Kellogg's toe the line, then who'd you go after next? Or is that part of the calculus? Yeah, no. we're not really saying that. We're, we're going to let it evolve. I don't want to have to be a brute force angry instrument. I think this is something that we need to work together on. And I'm hoping, again, that Kellogg is the first that shows they can behave more responsibly and they set the way for other large food companies. But we are definitely reserving our rights of calling out other food companies that we think are behaving unethically. And what we talked about at the beginning of the call, Sean, what they're doing is technically not illegal, which is why they're still doing it. And I think that's the issue is how do we have some sense of moral decency with public or large companies to say, you know what, we can make a little more money if we did this, but we're not doing it. 
And we have to start creating a conversation where that becomes permissible in the boardrooms and there's less fear of getting fired by doing anything that doesn't just purely maximize profit. And we'll see. Hopefully, this is going to create a groundswell and and listeners like you have and lots of other people will start raising the flag and, and getting them to start behaving more responsibly. Yeah, I just went to your uh, your Twitter account and I just retweeted and said you're suing Kellogg's and asking other people to sign a petition and retweet it out. So hopefully we can get that 100,000 uh, in, in, in a short order. So that would be awesome. Uh, Jason, I know I you have to go. Uh, I appreciate this information and of course what you're, what you're attempting to do and hopefully you'll have decent success at that. Because like I said, as a physician, it's frustrating. It's just like if you could just say, let's stop poisoning people, we would probably cut chronic disease at least in half and probably by more than that. But thanks for doing this stuff. Appreciate it. Remind, yeah, people, what, where to go, remind people where to go once again so if they want to help. Yeah, just a, a, a few kind of closing thoughts. The first, which is a question that comes up a lot, and it's why I've chosen the path that I've chosen in terms of the kinds of foods and companies that we're involved in. One of the complaints or comments from people is, but that food tastes better. And, and real healthy, natural food doesn't really taste good. And once in a while, I want to be able to have my vice. And that was the problem that I had when I was really sick. I had to give up all the foods that I loved. And I grew up on a lot of junk food. And it turns out, as you can make amazing comfort foods and foods that bring people joy, things like chocolate and pizza and ice cream that are not pure health foods the way just a slab of steak is, but they're wildly better for you and they taste better. And I I would also just tell your listeners as just a minor plug for what I do is try our products. Like you'll see if you try Against the Grain or you try Cosmic Bliss or you try Snow Days, you'll be shocked with how amazing they are without all of this shit in it. And part of why I do what I do is to actually show the world that you can do this, that it's possible, that you can have these kinds of indulgent or these kind of foods that bring you happiness without the compromise. And you can check more about us at humanco, H-U-M-A-N-C-O, humanco.com. My own handles is, again, is human carp. I will put in, uh, I'll email you, Sean, the petition link that's, it's under the Food Babe website. It's foodbabe.com slash baby shark, because she started this petition when the baby shark stuff was starting to come out. So it's misnamed in terms of the URL, but you'll see there that you just put in your name and your email address. And yeah, you can follow all of our companies and each of our companies have their own handle on Instagram, Find Cosmic Bliss, Against the Grain, and Snow Days. And then for True Food Kitchen, it's at Live True Food. And True Food is a great place that you can physically go and experience much cleaner farm-to-table food without any of this crap in it. And the True Food Kitchen... They're located in one location or are there multiple locations? There's 45 locations of True Food in 17 states. If you go to the True Food Kitchen website, there's a, a very convenient, you put in your zip code and you'll see the closest ones to you. And as well as if you go to any of my brand websites, if you go to find, if you go to CosmicBliss.com, you put in your zip code, you'll see what stores carry our products. Jason, thank you. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me.